Okay, hi, this is Paul Cockshot here. Um, I've been asked by Finball to give a talk. Um, he left it open what topic to cover. I uh, suggested either something on why bourgeois economics is wrong or something on market socialism and why market socialism uh, has, has limitations or reasons to be sceptical of it. And because I've put up lots of videos already on what's wrong with bourgeois economics, I decided what I'd do was the market socialism one, as I haven't produced much in the way of actual talks on market socialism. So I'm going to, the talk's called Limits of Market Socialism. And if you want to be following it on slides, I'm moving on to slide two. And basically, the summary of my talk is that I'm going to be dealing with the the role that the ideology of market socialism played in the collapse of hitherto existing socialism. Then I'm going to go on to a somewhat technical argument about its effect on wealth distribution, mention a bit about unemployment, and at the end, I'll finish on the limited positive role that markets have under socialism in terms of consumer goods markets and in terms of transitional measures when shifting from a capitalist economy to a socialist economy or a communist economy. Now, let's focus on the ideological role because that is quite critical to follow what happened from the 1960s through to the um, late 1980s in the existing Soviet bloc, a socialist bloc. Um, during the 1960s to the mid 80s in Eastern Europe, market socialism was initially presented as a reform of the existing socialist system. The claim was being made that the advocates of market socialism just wanted a better socialism. They wanted one that was more responsive to consumer demand. And also, if you take the case of the, the people from um, Yugoslavia, they wanted one which would give more autonomy to workers at I individual factories. Now, that was how it was presented initially. Now, when you look at the concrete aims or the concrete demands, there was a gradual escalation of them. The One of the first objectives was to allow enterprises to return more of their turnover. And it was said that this would lead to greater efficiency because it would give incentives to factory managers to operate efficiently if, if the enterprise was able to, com to hold more of its turnover. Now, obviously, behind that, there's a distributional issue. There's an issue of, is the state able to actually appropriate the product produced in its factories, or does the product, to some extent, become the private property, at least of the enterprise, and possibly of the, the managers in the enterprise? Another goal was to allow some flexibility in the setting of prices. And this argument for flexibility of the setting of prices has some credibility because often the administered prices were essentially could be quite far removed from prices that are proportional to values. The law of value was not closely followed in the sense that when I use the term law of value here, I mean they were not closely following the principle that the selling price of goods to consumers should be proportional to the labour time incorporated in them. They roughly followed this, but not as closely as might be the case. And in certain critical goods, or classes of goods, there was quite significant deviations of prices from values. And this could be presented as a failure to meet market needs or market demand. Uh, so that the, when talking about the law of value in the Soviet 
block, there was a, a confusion between do you mean the accurate representation of embodied labour time or by the law of value, do you mean just a shorthand way of saying determination of price by supply and demand? It, in a sense, some people talking of the law of value were using it as a, a way of incorporating uh, basically neoclassical near, near ideas about price. It was also argued that uh, market socialism would allow the formation of worker co-ops. And this is a theme which you also get fairly widely in, in the West among uh, anarchist currents or syndicalist currents. And if you look at the in initial reforms by Gorbachev, he allowed the formation of workers' co-ops, but at that stage still said that the private employment of wage labour should be prohibited, i.e. it was still seen as something exploitative and something which shouldn't be permitted. So at this stage, it's still within the realms of socialism in that it is seeking to make sure that there is no um, income from exploitation and in income from the, the exploitation of labour power. Uh, I'm now on to number seven. The effects of this, though, once it started to be put in, were to rehabilitate near lib or liberal economics, rehabilitate ideas from um, Western economic studies. And it created general license to criticize and rubbish socialist ideology. And you also got in the, the USSR, certainly, the growth of a plethora of small businesses who were exploiting what were nominally um, co-ops in order to set up what were really um, capitalist businesses and that they were co-ops in name only. Uh, and this established a new um, private bourgeois class, uh, a class of uh, private business managers. The effect of the other demand for the retention of more turnover by state enterprises was to generate a shortage of state revenue. You have to realize that in the USSR, a substantial part of the total state revenue came from the profits that were being made by state factories, which were uh, handed over to the to the government and could then be used to finance social services, finance defence, uh, finance research and development, etc. So these had been a key part of state revenue. And if you just ceding to the demands of the, um, the pro- market sector of the managerial class allow the local managers to, to, to have a larger share of that, obviously a smaller share goes to the state. And unless at the same time some alternative system of taxation had been introduced, the inevitable effect is you get a state budget deficit and you had the printing of money to cover the, the government spending, you got rapid inflation, you got growing shortages. So all of these were direct economic effects during the Gorbachev period of putting into practice the, the, the demands of the market socialists. So we're on pay, uh, page 10 now. And particularly as a result of um, the inflation and shortages, you've got a growing social crisis and, and stormy class struggles taking place. And we know what happened in the end. It was the wreck of the, the state in, in the Soviet case. Now, we know it doesn't necessarily lead to the wreck of the state because in the Yugoslav case, you had market socialist measures introduced 30 years earlier, or more than 30 years earlier, maybe 35 years earlier. And 
This didn't lead to immediately to the wreck of, of the socialist state in Yugoslavia. The, the socialist state in Yugoslavia didn't actually collapse until after the, the Soviet, Soviet bloc started to collapse. But in the Soviet case, on page 11 now, the effect was the eventual drowning of socialism. The, there was mass morta the, the, you had a rapid shift to a capitalist economy, mass mortality in the working class, particularly among m males and particularly among manual workers. Um, you had unemployment, you had hunger, you had around 12 million excess deaths in the 20 years which followed the transition to capitalism. About 12 million excess deaths in Russia alone. That's not counting the excess deaths in the Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, etc. Now, now, why did all this happen? Let's for a moment ignore the political overdetermination. The fact that the demands for market socialism in the USSR were overdetermined by a struggle between Marxism and Western economic ideology and overdetermined by class contradictions between the working class and the intelligentsia. Let's put that aside and assume you start off with something which is of not, not of that character, something more like what happened in Yugoslavia. We have to say, why is market socialism an unstable mix? Why is it likely to get blown onto the rocks? Um, I'm on number 14 now. If you look at what Lenin was saying in the early stages of the NEP, he's making concessions towards the market at that point. But he also says that the market economy constantly at a thousand places gives rise to capitalist relations. And he knew this from his very early work, the development of capitalism in Russia, his work on the transition to capitalism in the Russian countryside, which um, was his first major uh, theoretical work. And he knew it on sociological grounds that you got a different where you had market relations penetrating into the countryside you had a differentiation of the peasantry into those who were richer and could employ labor and those who were poorer and had to work for others and you got the for gradual formation of capitalist relations in the countryside and which in the development of capitalism in Russia, he was basically saying this is irreversible. Now, we now know that there are deep statistical reasons for this. And we know it for, for, because of another Russian, Viktor Yakovenko, who in the 90s, I think it was, wrote what, uh, a very important article, The Statistical Mechanics of money and he was able to show that what Lenin had just observed as an empirical fact is a necessary consequence of monetary economic relations. He's a theoretical physicist or solid-state physicist and Yakovenko found a he's a physicist but being a Russian who did his university education during the Soviet period, the only economics he had learned was Marx's capital. Now, he found that there was a deep correspondence between commodity trainers or owners of commodities and molecules in a gas, and there's a deep correspondence between the money held by commodity traders and the energy of molecules in the gas. Now, in a certain sense, you can immediately see that there is a relationship, at least, in that market economies are chaotic, disorganized systems. They're also systems with very large numbers of agents, individuals and firms. So they're, 
they must have bulk statistics, bulk statistical properties. And the question is, what are the laws which govern this? Now, in a gas, you've got molecules buzzing around and they keep bumping into one another. And when they collide, there's an exchange of energy between the, mo between the, the molecules. But this exchange is governed by um, conservation laws. But at a similar level, whenever a commodity transaction takes place, someone buys something for money, whether it's uh, an employer buying labour power or you buying something in the shop or one firm selling something to another. If you just consider the money and ignore the commodity that moves, just consider the circulation of money, these are random interactions in which money is exchanged or money is transferred rather. Just as in molecular collisions, you have random interactions in which energy is transferred. But in both cases, there's a conservation law. The quantity of energy or the quantity of money is conserved. And this imposes on both of them the same sort of aggregate statistics. Now, can I suggest you all go to slide 20 because if you can there is a video uh, which you should be able to watch there if you click on the that slide there is a um, start icon for the start of a video if you click on it you will see an animation of what happens to a half a million agents, each of whom start off with the same amount of money. As it evolves, you see that a direct distribution, sorry, I'll go right back to the start. Go back to here. A direct distribution is one where everyone is the same. And that rapidly develops towards a Gaussian or normal distribution of money which is, that's fair enough. And the normal distribution spreads out until the left-hand side of it reaches zero. And that's people with no money at all. And as you observe it over time, you see the number of people with no money at all grows. And on the other side, you get a few people with a lot of money. The longer you run it, just a simulation, what's going on behind the scenes in generating this was a simulation of half a million agents interacting, each making small transactions between one another. And as it runs on, we'll move on to, to, to um, sl slide 21. You end up with a distribution of money among the agents, which very closely fits the red line. And the red line is what's known as the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution, which is the law which governs energy in a gas, on the molecules of a gas. So he shows from simulation that you would expect money held by agents to follow the same law as energy of molecules in a gas. You get lots of people with almost no money and a small number of people with a lot of money. And this is just due to the random interaction that is taking place. And in both in the gas and in an economy, this is the result of the law of increasing entropy. If you look at the bottom side of the animation, you can see the entropy of the distribution. And it rises towards a plateau and stabilizes uh, at a maximal entropy state. And the maximum entropy state is the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution. Um, in his original paper, he has slides, which I reproduce here on sheet 22, of what the actual empirical distribution of money holdings in the United States are. And they fit almost exactly to this um, Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution. So he starts off from a purely theoretical argument about the nature of conservation laws and, and chaotic systems, predicts a distribution, 
observes that's what actually happens in a in a real capitalist economy. So why is this relevant for market socialism? Suppose you set out start with a set of co-ops and individual producers and they're all equal at the beginning. The law of increasing entropy means that over time the money that these co-ops or, or individual artists' hands will have will end up highly uneven. Even if it started off even, it'll become uneven as a result of random processes. A few co-ops will end up with a lot of money and many will have very little. Many will be effectively bankrupt in, in these terms. This means you get the creation of a reserve army of labour. A market economy, including one made of co-ops, has no guarantee that it'll operate at full employment. This has been, this was theoretically demonstrated by Kleski and Keynes in the 30s, um, obviously assumed by Marx, um, but people talking about market socialism tend to overlook this. They just assume there'll be full employment. There won't. And when you couple the existence of a reserve army of labour with the differentiation of co-ops, what's going to happen? Some people are going to migrate. Yugoslavia had a chronic uh, labour migration problem of people migrating to, to Germany, which the Titoist government was willing to put up with because it reduced the level of visible unemployment in Yugoslavia. But the fact that this reserve army of labour existed and that this emigration was taking place indicates that the market socialist economy did not automatically work at a level which would ensure full employment. Now, if, if you don't have the option of forcing the unemployed to emigrate, the pressure to allow the employment of workers from the bankrupt co-ops by other co-ops under what would amount to wage labour is going to be huge. Even if it's not going to be overt wage labour, it could be something like labour-only subcontracting, the effect would be the same. Some co-ops which had lots of cash would end up effectively employing the workers from the co-ops with no cash. And once wage labour is introduced, then the differentiation of income becomes much more extreme. Up until now, the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution just deals with the differentiation of income due to random statistical fluctuations. Once wage labour is involved, you get a new mechanism. And both Yakov Enko and Ian Wright, with whom I was one of the co-authors of Classical Econophysics, show that when this happens, you get the formation of a class of super-rich. Just the um, Gibbs-Boltzmann uh, distribution will never end up with anyone as rich as Warren Buffett or uh, Bill Gates. But once you allow the exploitation of labour power, you get a new distribution for the super rich. You get a distribution which is a power law distribution rather than a, a negative exponential distribution, which gets allows people to become much richer. And then essentially you have a capitalist economy. Socialism's back on the rocks. However, um, I'm now in number 26. Market socialism is feasible as a transitional measure. In fact, it, in some sense, it's almost unavoidable as a, a transitional measure. Before you have a comprehensive planning system, before that has been established, some form of markets are, are going to be inevitable. The question is, how? What form of markets should a communist government aim for? In my view, you should aim for the transfer of all private enterprises into worker co-ops immediately. A transfer to a, a Yugoslav type economy straight away 
before you have the ability to to plan everything because the first task is to put all the surplus under the control of the working class even if it's in the hands of small groups of workers it takes it out of the hands of the bourgeoisie so market co-ops are a market socialism in the form of mass cooperatives is an immediate measure that can be taken and is a progressive measure in the context of an already existing capitalist economy but to prevent the atomization and competition and um, random differentiation of income that uh, I described earlier, you immediately have to try and bring all the co-ops together um, into some co super co-op level structure. Um, the I think there's a lot to be said for the Delianist program in this sense that you the first step after establishing the co-ops is to establish syndicates based perhaps on the existing trade unions um, so you'd have dairy work a dairy worker syndicate which managed all the the factories producing yogurt cheese etc uh, an automobile worker syndicate which managed all the car factories which had previously been owned by a variety of different private uh, companies etc transport worker syndicate that would unify the land um, transport by road and by rail to prevent the competition between them. Once you've got that you're in a position in parallel with this to introduce social planning, um, have calculation in kind for these these syndicates and once you have that going then you can abolish money. You can't do it so long as the actual supply of goods to the individual syndicates depends on them being able to purchase from other syndicates. Let's assume that's been done. What do you have left? Well, what you have left is just a sort of pseudo market under communism. What in the first stage of communism? What uh, Marx describes as the the continued existence of bourgeois right. It's not based on money at this stage it's based on labor credits and it only works in the consumer goods sector I'm on uh, slide 30 the as I say it's re restricted to consumption goods it's not doesn't apply to means of production because these are allocated between the syndicates by plan by the between the freely associated producers as Marx puts it and there are no private sales. Sales of consumer goods occur only through the cooperative shops or through the, the state shops. So that private business is eliminated in part because you, the, as Marx says, the um, labour credits are no more money than a theatre ticket. They're ca cancelled out as soon as they're um, the, they're given up at a, a state factory or state warehouse. So that is, I don't know how long I've been talking, that's the end of uh, my planned talk at 40 minutes, that's longer than I expected. So I'm ready for questions now. Hello, anyone there? Yeah.